And you know, in a way, we were all kind of at the same level. You know, I mean, and that was kind of great too because you know you didn't have to hold back. You know, Malcolm never had to play catch up. I never had to play catch up. With Malcolm, you know, it's like here uh, this, and I knew whatever you could do would just be perfect. You know, it's like if the guy playing the sax next to you, uh, you know, you lay off the lead and he will pick it up and tear it, you know, take it to the next stage, and then you pick it up from there. And, you know, it's just the parts were just perfectly portioned out. You know, I think that worked out very well. You guys were an awesome team. Oh, thank you. I wish you could have gone on. What do you think of the show? I mean, you know, you haven't seen a lot of this stuff for years and years. It brings back some memories. You know, some of them good and some of them bad. I mean, the good memories are all in the process of the thing. You know, just, for example, from the David Game covers, it's like, I remember when this came out, and I remember I had no idea how he did that. <laughs> you know, and then I asked him about it a year later, he's like, oh, just this and this and this and this, and he just makes it sound so simple, and you go, uh, you know, Dave is one of those masters that makes it comparably easy, and to hear him describe it, it is. You know, he can take some things that should be patently obvious, and they don't look that way. You know, he's just kind of amazing for that. Um, you know, there was that aspect of the work that I, I really, uh, I really miss. You know, just knowing that you, you just did a perfect page where, you know, that after a couple of tries, you know, you know, that I managed to get a sequence that worked just perfectly, you know, because Neil's dialogue, for example, quite often never really quite matched up to his panel vision. And I've heard this from so many of the sad uh, hours. They're like, oh my god, Neil's dialogue, how am I supposed to draw around it? <laughs> yeah, well, Neil comes from this kind of classic sort of British school of panel design, you know, very much like Alan Moore, you know, or, um, Grant Morrison, where you, like, you have the eight panel grid, you know, or the 12 panel grid, you know, and they use this to kind of regulate the way that they write themselves, right? But the thing is, all dialogue and all speech have a very natural rhythm to them. And, you know, if you, even just watching, like, one of the great uh, screwball comedies from the 1930s, like, anything with, say, like, uh, oh, like, Myrna Loy and, um, oh, what was his name, the Thin Man movies? William Powell, yes. you know, or, uh, Oh, geez. Uh, Carrie Grant, Captain Pepper, the Philadelphia story, and Bring Me Up Baby. Oh, we're going to talk about me now. Good day. You know, little things like that. Okay, how do you actually render that in one panel and get every menacing, coy, snide element to that and break the dialogue up perfectly? You know, Dave Sim can do it. Dave Sim abandoned the idea of the panel order back around service 10. And from that point on, everything Dave Sim was, did in terms of his panel divisions was almost entirely dialogue driven. Everything that he did was entirely driven by the dialogue and pacing. And he realized that that was a great liberating thing, you know, because as he said, you know, it takes every bit as much effort to draw industrial strength funny as it does to draw industrial strength serious. And if you liberate yourself from the panel workers, then you are free to focus on the actual narrative itself. And so what I did frequently was I just basically scrapped into those panel designs and just kind of looked at his dialogue and tried to parse it out for the timing that was a natural to it. You know, and I ended up with some really, really funny bits that I don't think even Neil was aware of. Like the uh, dialogue between uh, Nuala and Clurigan, which frankly I read it and I went, that is Catherine Hepburn and Carrie Grant. Um, <laughs> let's just divide this up. You know, excuse me, I'm going to that. You know, Neil was not even, that just didn't even occur to them until I read it to him doing my best impersonation of their voices. Look, right, what are you telling him? Oh, nothing, you all, I just mind your business for a moment. You know, and I basically, I paced it all out according to that and it worked much better. And I think Neil was highly amused at the way that worked, you know. And, uh, you know, those were the touches that I had. There's a lot of the touches yeah. you got. <laughs> You know, but you know, of course, I would get these, you know, calls. You know, this is supposed to be the script that's deviated from the layout. And I was like, oh, again, come on, don't you have something better to do? Well, you know, we have time for some audience questions. Yeah, you know, rapid fire. Uh, <laughs> rapid fire. Rapid fire. Well, they're not really rapid fire questions, unfortunately. This is one I was actually thinking of asking you anyway. So I'm glad an audience member grabbed it. Um, do you have a particular uh, kind of favorite or a moment in like your Sandman pages that you're really, really proud of? And what about that might it? You know, it just... 
gives you that sense of achievement. You know, I can't do that Jack Benny gesture as well as he did. Um, oh my. I think probably some of my favorite moments uh, would have been the Dream Vortex sequence. Mm -hmm. And that was also one of my most crushing defeats when they frankly just didn't follow my notes on how the dialogue balloons were supposed to be placed. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure whether it's because they didn't understand them or they fell off or they just decided it wasn't expedient to bother. Can I assume that they should have been more swirly? Well, you or actually, actually had I, had I did this the same way that Dave Sim did. Right. You know, when he took the okay. uh, Sarah's six crises issues on their sides. Right. And there's one scene in there where Sarah's, you know, basically waking out of a death dealing hangover mm -hmm. comes staggering into the war room and you rotate the pages because you read the dialogue sideways. And then, oh, read it that way. And Sarah is basically going, you know, and, oh, wow, yeah, okay. Hodges is upside down because Sarah frankly, just is sideways. You know, and read it through like that. You know, and finally settles back into its regular position. And then for the first time in six issues goes, oh, like, great effect. Because for the first time in six issues, Sarah is actually having a moment of clarity with regard to his entire situation as prime minister six issues to build up to that one clunk. Beautiful. You know? That's the way I was thinking about this. And I was thinking about that dream vortex, the same thing. We had this entire story arc that's been leading up to this. You know, we've been breaking up the panels and doing weird things with them, you know, for four or five pages, and then we've got this. Instead of just doing this thing, how about we actually start rotating the pages? You know, as if we're basically just flipping around this vortex ourselves. Everybody else in the story is. Why not us? Mm -hmm. So, you know, read the dialogue, it's sideways, you know, turn it that way, to read the next one, boom, and this way, you know, turn it over, and then you're upside down, you're holding the book upside down. So if you want to actually get to where it's reading the right side, other than you just have to keep following it through, and then turn the page again, and then you're sideways, and then it rotates right side up, going the right direction by the time you're finished. I mean, that takes a lot of thinking and a lot of planning, and, you know, I scrapped, like, three versions of that before I finally got the right one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I... You know, just for a little bit of trivia, um, I owe a certain amount of the way that I thought about that to Japanese manga artist Sante Shirato. Um, not that anything like that was actually within his style. A very, very traditional manga artist. In fact, he was the uh, fellow who trained Koji, Lone Wolf and Cub. He, that was his, he was uh, Shirato's apprentice. Um, but uh, Shirato, in order to really appreciate the, the moments where it all just kind of like boom in his work. Um, I literally took an entire tankaban of Kamu, uh, Kamui Den and broke it down into these little stick figure diagrams of the individual panels with little red dots indicating what the character actions were and arrows off the page, you know, into the different directions where the motion flowed. And I literally broke it down for an entire 270 pages of the tankaban over the two page spreads and the whole nine yards. Just looking at the way the story actually flowed in between the panels, in between the pages, you know, how it moved across two pages at a time, or even four pages when you had multiple two page spreads. And I made a very specific note of how fast things happened. You know, when you eliminated dialogue in one of the large panels and things like that, or even eliminated background in one of the small intricate panels, how you could convey moments very, very quickly. This that was my education of how to actually do a comic book between that and Hitchcock. Uh, you know, Jill Deleuze, uh, you know, the motion image and the time image. Um, you know, it wasn't how to, re how to, do, how to draw comics the Marvel way. You know, I'm sorry. Uh, Very different. Right. Fortunately. Um, what, was the, what was the question again? The question was if there was a particular page. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> and of course, when they, actually, when they actually printed that, of course, it was all, you know, it was utterly lost. And to this day, every compilation they've done since, even the absolutes, even the omnibus, they have never bothered to create. So this it. sounds to me like when the absolutes DC. came out, I actually volunteered to redraw those pages in their correct order for free. So do, do we all agree that DC needs to get on absolutely absolute Sandman for real this time? Because there's a lot of screw ups in those books. Well, the really the thing that actually got Neil that we were in a sort of problem situation was the Green Heimlord flood in Sandman Nine. Well, uh, you know, the woman's a Martian. Yes. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Um, is there a subsequent uh, Sandman story that you would have really liked to illustrate? 
Um, well, there are parts of a game of you that I would have loved to have drawn, but Stan did such a beautiful job with it all uh, that you know, I'm quite content just to read it. And that's kind of the way that it is to enjoy the work. You know, there's so much of it that I would have loved to have you know, my own little fingers on. Um, but you know, I think it was, for the most part, just done so well. You know, there's no way that, you know, like for example, the Alex Stevens issue. None of the way that that was rendered would ever in a thousand years have occurred to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that's completely and uniquely his. You know, or even the way that, you know, Jay Luke did all those wonderful, you know, Zen paintings. Would never have occurred to me to do that. I mean, I could do it in a technical area. I mean, I did take classes in, you know, Chinese style painting. Taught by an era history teacher. Um, but, um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do it that way. You know, and that is kind of the marvel of the thing. Pardon me, all reference. Um, you know, that I look at it, and so many different stylists, you know, came up with so many different interpretations of Sandman. This is, I think, a very important point, is that the Sandman, in his own way, actually tops Doctor Who in this regard. And I think Doctor Who is brilliant for it. You know, you have, for example, you know, with the, with the Doctor, if an, uh, an actor gets tired of portraying him, or the ratings slip, or whatever, well, you know, they can get another actor. He goes through a regeneration se sequence and bang, you know, it's uh, David Tennant and, you know, Eccleston goes off someplace else, or, you know, bang, it's David Smith. And, you know, Tennant goes off and does something else. Does cop dramas or whatever. And, uh, you know, but it's a new doctor. You know, it's always gonna be a new doctor. Sandman is even more fluid, because as an archetype, and this is, again, when dealing with the idea of an archetype, you know, that was something that I started, I, I thought from minute one, I will open myself up to just very synchronistic action on this. Um, you know, there will be a synergy. I simply, you know, again, this was something I got from Francis Ford Coppola, of all people. Because uh, when I was in college, when I was taking my film classes, I happened to find a typewritten copy of Eleanor's, Eleanor Coppola's diary from the making of the Apocalypse Now, which eventually became the film Hearts of Darkness. Uh, but sure, I was reading this thing and I was looking, my God, Coppola became Kurtz. You know, in the process of doing this, you know, he was this madman up the river with this insane film crew, you know, just bait, you know, all of Hollywood going, where the hell are you? What are we doing? What kind of madness is this? And he's up there creating this brilliant film um, under circumstances where, you know, one day he's ready to shoot himself in the head, and the next day he's patting himself on the back for being a genius. You know, they're importing piles and piles of, like, actual, like, Italian food simply because the Italian film crew will not eat anything local. You know, all these crazy, insane things you hear about this, and it was all true. You know, and he basically let himself become Kurtz. And so to a certain extent, you know, I kind of opened myself up, you know, to this process of synchronicity, you know, in dealing with the idea of an archetypal character. And, you know, it worked for me. But also, in the broader sense, this actually worked for the character, because every single interpretation of the character, therefore, is completely valid. You know, not only from the character's own views, all the character's views of the sand, or the, or the death, or of all the other ones, are perfectly valid. You know, every other artist's interpretation of them is too. You know, that's just genius. You talked a lot about the video past tonight. Let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, do you still have the drive to do things in comics? To do something in truly earth-shaking, perspective-changing? I know you do. Tell everybody a little bit about what you're up to. I wouldn't say it's perspective changing. Just... Come on, it's awesome. I'm so excited to play it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making an adaptation of Anger Out and Story. Message down in a bottle. Which is, uh, it's posing its own particular set of challenges, but I'm having a lot of fun doing the layouts. It's going to be gorgeous. All I can say. It's going to be my tribute to Bernie Wrights and Infinite Trier. So, you know, this is going back to the very fine framework, you know, and all those crazy, strange, demonic monsters in the wind and in the ships and so on. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yep. I'm doing this on oversized pages. Yes, I know. And they're actually like <laughs> silver age size. They're going to be amazing. Thank you. Even though I'm on page five and you haven't seen me before. <laughs> but I have actually faced me. I always have. Well, that's why you're my agent. <laughs> <laughs> I do loathe the word agent. 